ours are a people in search of a state and therefore doesn't the discussion become a completely different uh, different one for you and in some ways a kind of meaningless one because here you don't even have a state uh, which which your people have been fighting for and the rest of the world is debating whether a state has succeeded or failed sure thank you um yeah no the um the discussion for us is an incredibly interesting one because it's basically we're in the position of trying desperately hard and anybody Can you just who knows, keep it closer? Yeah. Anybody who knows anything about Palestinian history, it's sort of been a quest for statehood since 1917, and it's been continuing, getting intensified in the UN corridors of the recent months, where we, you know, we got UNESCO status, but even that was heavily con um, um, contested. And when it got through, it, the, the US immediately pulled all sponsorship for UNESCO as a body. And then again, recently, we've now got non-observer status, status. non-member observer status and it's like these little pushes which each stage of the way there's a huge amount of resistance at the end of the day if we do get statehood it seems pretty much sure that we're destined to be designated as failed that's been predetermined mm -hmm. because yeah. it's just so you have to work very hard to be told that you've really got nowhere but in terms of controls over borders, I mean, there's not a chance because it's all controlled externally. I don't know how occupation fits into the paradigm of the failed state model because it, I can't see any way of working around it. Um, attempts at autonomy are attempts to gain control over one's life, which seem to be positive steps for development. So again, it's, 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 a, it's a model which is, riles against the, 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 the realities on the ground and the hopes for the place and it just negates it and um, makes the situation seem irreparable somehow. And uh, Lali, I'm sure that has some resonance uh, for you as well. I mean, you were a little child when you had to leave Iran as, as uh, you've, you've written about the whole Kurdish displacement. Again, the st word state, before we can even agree on what's a failed state, can we agree on what a state is? Well, I think that if you look at what Reza used to define both nation and state, those are relatively new concepts to yeah. the countries of Africa, Asia, and the Middle East, and they were brought by Western imperialist powers. So, of course, they're going to declare when they fail because they invented them. And I think <laughs> that um, in terms of a failed state, what is a successful state, you know? And how exactly does a state serve a people? As a Kurd, I feel like uh, there's a sort of space in which having no state has been incredibly beneficial to them. And failure is irrelevant because it doesn't exist. The structure in which to bind the Kurdish people in Syria, in Turkey, in Iran, doesn't have any status with them. And so they've been able to maximize their conditions locally with the states that they're already in to serve them best. They are the most stable region in Iraq right now. And in Iran, they don't have that much tension with the government, and they're not, not necessarily thriving, but they're not persecuted as they had been mm. in the past. And in Turkey, things are slow, but they are progressing in a small way. If they were united, they wouldn't be able to agree on a leader, and that would cause war unto itself, and then they would fail. So given that state never meant anything to them in the first place, they're a rather successful non-state. Hmm. Declan, uh, since you're hearing this kind of, uh, not just skepticism, but I think very personally experienced accounts, not just of displacement and identity, but also times when the whole notion of a state becomes meaningless because history is not static, it evolves, and it's, it's constantly dynamic. Now, you've spent so much time writing and working in Pakistan. The question is this. It's quite familiar for many of us who are journalists to hear uh, this or to observe this kind of fault line between how the West, the Western paradigm defines a failed state and how the people in those parts of the world define it for themselves. This then begs the question that in what circumstances does a Western-led intervention, whether military or otherwise, become something that can be morally rationalized? Because Afghanistan, for example, often listed as a failed state, is going to be in a mess. You have the Americans leaving it. Iraq, that routinely figures on that list uh, of failed states, has been abandoned. So hasn't the circle just completed itself in both of these prime examples of Western intervention? Um, just to uh, ram back on something some of the earlier speakers said, it seemed my objection to the term failed state is that Principally, it, it becomes, it's become part of the modern lexicon, a bit like the word terrorist, 
where the power of the phrase is in the person who's saying it and who it's directed towards. Um, and often in, in terms of Pakistan and other countries, it actually, I think, becomes synonymous where people say failed state. What they actually mean is failed ideology or rogue state or something like that. Mm. Um, it certainly has been used um, to justify interventions, but I think it wouldn't be right to suggest that it's the only reason, obviously, those interventions have been, have been justified. Um, but when you look around you, I, I mean, I think when we talk about Pakistan or indeed about Afghanistan or Iraq, um, it is important, while I appreciate what some of the other speakers said about how a country can be defined either by, as Shamin said, by the quality of the people who live there, um, or as Mary said, by the fact that even if it falls outside conventional definitions, it can still be a viable place to live. In Pakistan, we, st we do have a serious problem where the state, as in the, the central government, the provincial governments, the apparatus of state, the thing that holds the country together on a day-to-day -day basis, is in serious trouble at the moment. Mm. Shermin, if I can take that to you, uh, the same National Intelligence Council report pr prophesizes a Yugoslavia-type outcome for Pakistan, a kind of balkanization, as it were, rather than a collapse of the state, several states emerging from one state. Now, history does point us in that direction. This is known to have happened. Yes. So while, while I, I do hear your voice of hope and optimism for your country, do you fear that? Do you fear that given what's happening uh, in several different parts of Pakistan, given the sectarian violence especially and the Shia genocide? Absolutely. I mean, there are some serious deep-seated issues in Pakistan. There is a Balochistan insurgency that uh, has been going on for a number of years and really has intensified. The sectarianism across Pakistan, minorities are being persecuted, and the state is failing. I do agree with Declan on that front, where it doesn't seem like the state has a cohesive policy on how to deal with some of this. Having said that, one of the things that I actually really do feel is that for the first time I'm seeing that people are coming out to express things. This has not happened at least in my lifetime in mm. Pakistan. I'm a post-1971 child so I've never seen mm. the breakup of the country. There have been enormous amounts of targeted killing against Shias in Pakistan but when 87 people were killed last month you found that you know and they stood um, in Quetta with the dead bodies, mm. you found people across Pakistan slowly coming out onto the streets. I always feel that when civil society starts acknowledging that there are issues and actually taking the first step to coming out in the streets, we are beginning to have the difficult conversation. Do I think that there will be a breakup of Pakistan in my lifetime? I seriously do believe that Balochistan may be headed that way, not primarily because of Pakistan, but also because it's in the interest of a number of other countries not to have Balochistan as part of Pakistan. It has a warm water port. It, ha it is rich in minerals. And there are, they, they obviously have grievances with the state. Yep. But, it's, but it's not something that's just, I think, controlled by Pakistan. I think Pakistan, unfortunately, is a country where a lot of other countries dictate what happens in that country. And Reza, that takes me to my next question. Uh, Sometimes a state can be in a phase of failure, of failing, and sometimes that can be linked to one individual. For example, a Mugabe-like figure in, in, in Zimbabwe, or more recently you've had Hosni Mubarak in Egypt or Muammar Gaddafi positioned as those kind of figures in their respective countries of Egypt and Libya. My question is this, since, since we are framing the conversation having agreed that we do not agree uh, on, on, on the Western prescription of a failed state, we're also looking at what circumstances uh, Western interference is a form of neocolonialism and in what circumstances it's a humane, much needed intervention. Mm. So I want to give you the example of Egypt and Libya and say, is that an example where you actually needed the otherwise much reviled Western intervention? Well, that's a really good question. I mean, in the case of Egypt, actually, according to the, the American uh, definition of failed state that I used, uh, under Mubarak, it was the exact opposite of a failed state. I mean, you have a dictatorial regime with utter control over every aspect of life, not just over security, but over uh, moral codes, over the economy. I mean, uh, it's, there's a very simple reason why the United States fosters mm. Uh, relations with dictatorial regimes. It's very easy to control what one person does, what one person says. Uh, you just have to, you know, give them a little bit of money and, and they'll do what you, you tell them to do. And, and <coughs> Mubarak was the perfect example of this. I mean, he, he jumped whenever the United States told him to jump. 
He, uh, you know, would close the Rafa closing, uh, uh, crossing whenever we asked him to do so. Uh, if we told him to allow the Muslim Brotherhood a little bit of freedom, he did. If we told him to reel it back in, he would. Uh, Mubarak was our, was our closest friend uh, in that regard. And now that he's gone, and now that there is, regardless of what you may think, a flourishing, vibrant, democratic process taking place mm. in, in Egypt, and that's a that's an, uh, a, a statement that I don't think can be doubted. You may disagree with how it's mm. coming about, mm. but it is there. I mean, there is a, a representative government and a vibrant conversation about the future of that country. Now the United States is nervous. Now we're, we're calling it, you know, possibly a failed state, when in reality it's actually expressing the values that, that the U.S. holds so, so dear. And in the case of uh, uh, Gaddafi in Libya, I mean, it's important to understand that while particularly the, everybody, all nation states do this, but the United States is very good at it, it to, to couch its foreign policy in the guise of humanitarian assistance, Frankly, we don't really care about humanitarian assistance. I mean, we do if it serves. I mean, if it Your serves our interests. interests yeah. If it serves our strategic interests, then yes. If Mubarak is killing thousands of his people, well, that's a shame. If Bahrain is mowing down innocent uh, protesters, sending doctors and nurses to prison for life for the crime of actually helping, you know, wounded protesters. That's okay, but if Qaddafi, who happens to sit on the eighth largest supply of, of oil on the planet, uh, is threatening to do the same thing, that we have to take care of. So, I, I, I'm not, I don't mean to say, I, I don't mean to say that, that the humanitarian issue plays no role at all. It does, but only in so far as it can be matched to our strategic, economic, and national security interests. Uh, Mary, if I can take that to you. Somalia today, uh, could it be held together by the safety pins that it is uh, without Western intervention? It's, it's, it's an extension in a sense of the same argument that I'm making to Reza, who says that, look, of course there are times when it's masquerades as we're doing this for the people, we're doing this for a set of values, but it has to coincide with the larger strategic interest. Are there examples that you can think of? Uh, maybe, for example, let's look at Suchi in Burma. Uh, where, for example, global pressure and global intervention has actually led to something positive. But when we look at Somalia, do you believe that without that Western intervention, Somalia would have collapsed? Uh, I, I believe the opposite, actually. And what's interesting is that in 1992, just, when, just be closer. When, when the U.S. first intervened, Originally, it did intervene. There was a massive humanitarian need. There was a famine and there was a civil war. And for the first few weeks, the Americans protected humanitarian convoys. But then the Americans, due to some rather stupid actions on their part, became part of the conflict. And so then they decided that Somalia was a failed state. And ever since then, they've just been... The argument they use now is that uh, it's not only Somalia that's a danger to itself, it's actually a danger to us in the US. Mm. Some diaspora Somali might come and blow themselves up in the middle of New York. So even though originally it was a sort of humanitarian motive, I don't know how real that motive was, but there was definitely a need. It very quickly got twisted into something else. And ever since then, every effort um, America's made to sort out Somalia has actually backfired horribly and made the situation worse. And I'm wondering with Mali now, and Reza mentioned it's now, maybe that's going to be defined as a failed state, and maybe that's a sort of, America will use that to justify the fact that it's sending in support to get rid of these alleged Al-Qaeda operatives there. The, the, can I ask you briefly, because you've had so much experience in Africa, that you do have sometimes countries that will go to the world and say, we're on the verge of collapse, and you had that happening with Guinea, for example. Uh, so. Is there, is, there a, is there a case that sometimes uh, you do need not Western intervention but global intervention? And is the problem uh, that there is no consensus actually on what is global intervention? And that is where we, we, we confuse the issue because we conflate West with world. Uh, absolutely. And it's interesting that in Somalia, again, uh, in the last few months, there has been some kind of success 
there's a bit more stability is being brought to that country. And even though there are Western hands behind it, it's actually a regional force, an African force, that has really seen the back of the most extremist elements, at least in the towns. So I think there are times when you do need some kind of intervention, but often Western intervention is absolutely the worst thing you can do. And, and I think with Mali, by the Westerners getting involved, it's just going to further radicalize more people and make the problem worse rather than better. And they're certainly not going to be able to bomb those people out of those towns. They're just going to melt away into the desert and become active in other countries. So I think a Western-led intervention in Mali is absolutely the worst thing that they could have done. Though, uh, Selma, is there a case to be made for the fact that democracy, maybe not in the short run, as, as Reza makes the point about Egypt, but definitely in the long run, almost always has a moderating influence on, on more radical and fundamentalist uh, elements. And if you take the case of Palestine, for example, uh, where it was seen entirely as an issue through the prism of militancy, uh, when it was seen uh, through Western eyes, but then you actually had a group like the Hamas contesting elections. And, and, and therefore, this dreaded Hamas at one point is now part of a process that is usually accompanied with a successful state. I mean, elections are one prescription, though we don't all agree on the, on, on the term. So I'm just wondering how those dynamics work for you, because while for some people borders are meaningless, coming from your experience, uh, the border has a very different and deeper meaning, as does the building of a state. Yeah. Well, thank you. I mean, one thing is that the, the of course, the state, the borders divide up the nation uh, in, in a most intricate way. You've got a nation of people divided into refugees, into cantons within the West Bank. You've got formal checkpoints. You've got about 500 flying checkpoints. You've got the West Bank, which is uh, under, a, uh, you've got Gaza, which is under a state of constant siege, um, uh, a land, air, and sea. And the, the elections there in, in, with, for Hamas, there you have a call for democracy, you have free and fair elections, and then you end up with a, a, a party being voted into power, which doesn't suit the, the Western agenda. And so the siege began in a very forceful way, and in a way that ties into this this question of how intervention works in mm. these areas, Western intervention, because you have all kinds of humanitarian aid flooding into Gaza, which all the reports come back saying none of this is effective because nobody will lift the siege on Gaza, which all of the is found to be illegal. This blockade is illegal. Do something about it. So in the case of Palestine, it's like you're asking a country for, to abstain from intervention and nobody's doing anything about it. Mm. And then I think there's quite a sort of clear cut. So it's the opposite experience. In a sense, you'd like to see more intervention in Palestine. So more intervention to get action upon resolutions which exist. It's, um, yeah. So Lali, is there a, to be some examples or moments in history where we would have wanted a stronger global response, and it didn't come. And as Selma says, Palestine is an example of that. Uh, but on the other hand, we are simultaneously making the argument that people are almost always better left to their own devices. So how do we resolve this paradox? Because sometimes people are not empowered enough, either because of uh, accidents of geography mm -hmm. or because of uh, the way power is structured globally. They can't fight the fight themselves. I mean, I think the truth of the matter in the case of the Kurds is that the paradox will continue to exist just because of the particular geography of the region, the inability to unify because of these mountains and the valley pockets, etc. But what's interesting is that when Saddam pursued the chemical bombing tactics against the, Iraq, against the Kurds in Iraq, the humanitarian inter intervention was very fickle, as humanitarian inter intervention is, and it depends on what the resources are in the country and the mood of the world and whether we need to do a live aid or some sort of Bono effort or <laughs> whatever it is. It just comes and goes in waves. Whether or not a state is there to receive that intervention seems to dictate how successful it is. If there were borders around the Kurds, maybe there could have been a little bit more of a sort of focused effort, but because they are kind of um, a, an amorphous body of 40 million people, nobody knows where to put the aid. And so in some cases, states can help in that. And in some cases, it works against them. So the paradox 
continues. And I think it continues in a number of these nations that we're talking about, where the Somalis and the Africans can do better to help themselves, humanitarian aid, than people from the outside. And the part of the state that is defined by borders is what is actually going to determine sometimes the success and sometimes the failure of people's sort of goodwill towards the mm -hmm. suffering people of that nation. Uh, Shermin, one of the paradoxical relationships for Pakistan is the relationship with the United States of America. It's seen some really dismal moments. Uh, it's seen uh, moments of near collapse after uh, Osama bin Laden was taken out without the Pakistani uh, authorities being taken into confidence. And it is now a little bit uh, sort of bandaged together as a relationship. But do you see this as a paradox of the kind that we're talking about, where because of how history has been shaped around Pakistan, your country is today uh, previously dependent, for example, on Western aid, but at the same time seeks a sort of assertive self-respect vis-a-vis it, uh, but they're controlling, in a sense, the money, and then that creates a relationship of power. So how does that work? Firstly, I mean, I really do think it's one of the most dysfunctional relationships the world has ever seen because yeah. now you have Senator John Kerry saying that Pakistan does not get enough credit for capturing Osama bin Laden. I mean, that's the statement he made yesterday uh, in trying to say that Pakistan deserves the aid that it gets. So, I mean, you know, it's it just the, the United States and Pakistan have a very, very difficult relationship. For years, Pakistan has been saying, I don't agree with that point of view, but the, the state has been saying, well, when America abandons Afghanistan, we are going to be left with the problem. Just this week, hundreds of Afghan Taliban fighters have been released from Pakistani jails on the behest of the Americans. What is going to happen to these men when they go back to Afghanistan or continue to fight the insurgency in Pakistan with the Pakistani Taliban? I mean, there, there are issues on many, many different levels. The Pakistani military is very dependent on the Americans. Do the Pakistani people want that relationship? Of course not, because who benefits at the end? The military does. The people do not. This aid that the United States has been saying it's been giving to Pakistan, millions and millions of dollars, where is it going? All of the aid that went to Afghanistan, what does the United States have to show for the aid that went to Afghanistan? I mean, the United States, to be honest, has failed Afghanistan and is failing Pakistan massively. It didn't know how to run Afghanistan. It's abandoning Afghanistan. With Pakistan, they have a long list of things Pakistan should do, but, but it, they, they don't, are not clear about what they want mm. either. Because first, we don't negotiate with terrorists. Now we do negotiate with terrorists. Massive corruption, US aid projects starting and stopping. I mean, there are so many different things that are happening. Um, with the relationship. I personally f I think that the United States should cut off all aid to Pakistan, absolutely. Really? All aid should be cut off to Pakistan. And why? Because we need to stand on our own two feet while the United States will be controlling Pakistan forever in this way. And to be honest, the most of the aid goes to the military. And we don't want that aid to be going to the military at all. Reza, if I can ask you, uh, on Afghanistan, you hear Sharmin saying, the United States has failed Afghanistan and now it's failing Pakistan. Is the problem in Afghanistan a long history of uh, people who came, saw and conquered and then left? Or is the problem that they came at all? Is it, is it that they left or is it that they came? <laughs> uh, wow, that's a really g difficult question. Uh, so let me ignore it and, uh, <laughs> and instead uh, just mention something that's important to understand about the U.S. relationship with Pakistan. The United States of America is at war with Pakistan. Since 2006, by the government's own numbers, we have killed almost 5,000 Pakistanis. That's a war. I don't know. I mean, it's a war being fought like a video game, but it's a war. So. This, this, this discussion about you know, this dysfunctional relationship, dysfunctional doesn't even begin to describe it. I mean, on the one hand, we've given them $10 billion since uh, 2011, uh, 2001, and you're absolutely right. This is not aid that goes to Pakistan. It's aid that goes to the Pakistani military so that they continue to fight the war on terror on America's behalf. But on the other hand, we are on a daily basis slaughtering Pakistani men, women, and children uh, with our military. So 
if you can wrap your mind around that, what that means, that here's some money and, oh, we're going to kill your citizens, uh, you get a sense of how dysfunctional this relationship is. With regard to Afghanistan, I think, and Declan, can, I think, can speak to this uh, better than I can, but it, it's important to understand that the President Obama is in this very uncomfortable position of having to put to, to an end wars that he himself did not begin. Uh, and in Iraq, it was very easy because that was an incredibly unpopular war. Uh, he had promised to put an end to it. But in Afghanistan, because he kept running on this promise that this was the good war, that yeah. Iraq was the bad war, and this is the good one, and we should focus on the good one, uh, and then very quickly realized, oh, no, this is, no, this is just as bad. Um, he's in this very difficult position, which is now why there's this discussion in, in, in the United States uh, about uh, leaving Afghanistan completely, not just uh, the original plan, which was to, to remove all uh, combat troops and leave a core of, of, of uh, officers there for training purposes and, and security purposes. We're now talking about just leaving completely, mm. which of course was what happened in the 1990s uh, and which led to the failed state and the, the beginning yeah. of this discussion again. So whether we should have been there in the first place or not, I think is a, is a difficult question, mm. but it, it's clear that we're repeating the, the so mistake do you, do, of history. Do you, do you think that the Americans should not leave right now, Afghanistan? <clears throat> I think that it, it I, I don't think that we're doing any favors to Afghanistan by having, as Colin Powell put it, broken it uh, and then leaving without trying to fix it. But the question is, is that, is there anything that the American military establishment can do to fix Afghanistan? I'm not sure if, if there is. Declan, if you want to pick up on that, I mean, Afghanistan, a, a very divided global opinion on what happens after the Americans leave and, and, and whether that spills over, as Sharmin was saying, into Pakistan then. I think, I think that's um, a very real danger, actually. Uh, continue on the theme of, going briefly back to the theme Just of... Just speak closer into the mic. Going uh, briefly back to the theme of failed states, I think what we see happening in Afghanistan right now is a, a military intervention that, as you say, is hastening its withdrawal. But what's also happened is the failure of the American idea of rebuilding the Afghan state over the last decade. I first went to Afghanistan about eight years ago, and it was very striking then that at the time the entire discourse was, even journalistically, was stories about you know, the, the, the West trying to help Afghans to set up a government and so on. What we've actually seen under the Obama administration in particular is the complete abandonment of any pretense of creating a viable Afghan oh. state. There's due to be an election uh, in 2014. It's very difficult to see under the present circumstances how a credible uh, democratic election can take place, particularly as the last one in 2009 was, was widely discredited. Um, on the Pakistani side of the equation, I think there's very real danger uh, coming into the next couple of years that you will see the American target, if you like, shrinking in Afghanistan as the numbers recede. Um, and you have a very large cadre of uh, young men, or older men indeed, who operate hmm. along that border area and who will, I think, probably turn their guns more inwardly on Afghanistan yeah. along other axes. We saw the uh, horrific um, sectarian bombing oh. in Quetta last month that Shamin referred to yeah. where about 100 people were killed in one attack. And I suspect, most unfortunately, that that may be a very ominous harbinger of things to come. Um, I have just about five minutes left before we start taking questions. So, Mary, if I can ask you, something we haven't spoken that much about is one of the, uh, the, the, the arguments offered sometimes for Western intervention in states uh, that are going through internal turmoil is that they become safe havens for terrorists. And, and that's what's said again and again, and which is why Bush's uh, statement after the 9-11 attacks. Uh, how, what is the counter argument to that in, in a country like Somalia, where you've said actually uh, the West has become part of the problem and not part of the solution. Yeah, in Somalia, what's um, so tragic is that in 2006, a group of Sharia courts yeah. who were not particularly extreme, even though they did have some harsh Sharia punishments, they came to power against all the odds in the south of Somalia and in Mogadishu. And for the first time in 17 years, people could walk at night without fear. Uh, there was, and this was a grassroots movement. Um, various Somali warlords uh, who uh, had the ear of the CIA 
gave a very different narrative. They said that these people are linked to Al-Qaeda. And America bought that argument and basically backed an Ethiopian intervention to bomb these people out of existence. Mm. And what did that alleged counter-terrorist action produce? It produced a, a, a movement called Al-Shabaab that is linked to Al-Qaeda mm. openly. So, I mean, it's a bit of, I'm slightly oversimplifying. But so you're saying it's a self-perpetuating cycle in a by sense. By the United States <coughs> yeah. intervening against something that they said was linked to Al-Qaeda. They actually created something that genuinely was. So it completely backfired. Uh, I just want to uh, take my last question before we open the floor for the audience to Selma and Lali. And the question is this, that both of you uh, come from experiences where uh, your history or your historical origin is, is in one part of the world, but perhaps where you've lived or you live now is actually in the West. And I'm just wondering how the dualism of that when it comes to a conversation like this, when you hear a phrase like neo-colonialism, when you hear uh, a phrase like Western intervention, uh, you know, because you've been shaped by two sets of cultures, by two sets of histories, uh, as it were. So what does the West mean to you? Because... Um, uh, well, I guess because I'm half, I mean, I'm half English, half Palestinian, you always have this kind of, I always get very oversensitive when you hear any kind of gross generalizations about yes. either cult culture. You, I mean, I, this phrase that Edward Said used to use, or the expression was a sort of cosmopolitanism, and you hope that you are... Um, you know, seeing the world in that in that vein, I think one it, it also, but how you develop politically is very much a part of what household you were brought up in, what yeah. is discussed in your house, and it varies not according to nationality but personalities really. Yeah. And um, the neo sort of colonial uh, route was one that my father abhorred. When I was living in Cairo when I was about 25, he sent me a copy of uh, Foreign Affairs magazine with my sister, and it had an article in it about how Africa should be recolonized. And it, it, my sister has stuck a post-it note on the top of it saying, Dad says this is what's going to happen if you don't do something about it. <laughs> kind of a bit of a tall order, but um, uh, it, no, so we had a very strong anti-colonial sort of Upbringing, upbringing, even though my, you know, my great uncles were in India, you know, I have that side on my English side very much, but um, the, the way that we are brought up was different. Yeah. Lali? Um, it's been interesting to grow up in the United States and have a public intellectual discourse as an American, and then to have a private sort of more emotional, familial discourse as a Kurd and a Persian living in America and it is the again public private sort of dichotomy and it's been fascinating to sit on the panel and hear in every single one of these conversations that it is always what is the United States going to do about this the United States as the grand puppeteer of mm. geopolitical pop like situations yeah and as living in the United States and watching that happen from afar to a place where my family lives you don't take sides. You sort of watch and you recognize that because the state is such a new concept in so many places in the world, that from conversations my family has had and the way that I know Persian and Kurdish history, there is a sense that I have in a very private place in myself that it is going to work itself out. And it has nothing to do with the United States. It's a question of time, you know? Yeah, time I think is, it's, it's, it's often about the long journey and not the short headline, uh, which is something that journalists, including mm -hmm. myself, tend to forget. Uh, we are going to take some questions. Uh, is there someone with a mic? Yes. Please raise your hand. Keep your question brief so that more of you get a chance to speak. I will call out uh, the questioner, all right, uh, the, the young lady here. Yes, with a pink scarf. If you can stand and ask your question. Uh, I'm not young anymore, Barkha. You're very young. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, but uh, I was surprised that uh, though most of the panelists disputed the U.S. definition of a failed state, the discussion seemed to continue about what the U.S. does and does not and should or should not do. I'm wondering whether there is a more expansive definition of the failed state that the panelists have. And on the anniversary of... Uh, the Rep uh, Republic Day of India. Uh, I wonder if I might provoke uh, the panelists to consider whether India, which fails to feed a majority of its population, co should be considered a failing state. Uh, 
Sharmin is, is, is dying to answer that but won't. So I'm going to give that to, uh, to Reza. Reza, if you, if you want to take that, at least the first part of it, is there a more expansive uh, definition? Since we don't agree on the Western pers uh, definition, do we have one of our own? Well, I, I don't think that there's a more expansive definition of a failed state because I think many people, as we've discussed up here, are, are um, questioning whether the term itself is a valid term. But to your larger point about the behemoth that is America and whether we are going to continue to live in a century in which uh, the United States and its actions, its decisions have ripples that everyone feels whether they like to or not, the answer to that is no. I think that what's happening, not just as a result of globalization and, and the rise of other nation states, um, but also because of the decline of the United States, the decline of its economic influence in the world, uh, the decline of its military influence in the world. Yes, we are still the number one military in the world. Yes, our defense budget is still larger than every other defense budget in the world combined. But we have learned in this last decade the limits of, of American military power, uh, particularly uh, as we are increasingly confronted with non-state entities, non-state actors. So I think that we are in, in, a, in a century of American decline, uh, the, the decline of American influence uh, it, it, on the global sphere. And so perhaps these grand American definitions will not be as important uh, as they have been in the 20th century. And I am not so stupid as to answer the second part of that question uh, in, this, in this panel. Okay, one thing we do have in India is uh, freedom of speech, so it sometimes comes under threat, but not a Jaipur. So anyone who wants to answer the second part of that question, feel free to do so. We'll take a question here from Ambassador Shahid Malik, who I've just spotted in the audience. Go ahead, sir. And then we have a question on the left. Yes, sure. Thank you very much. It's been a most enlightening discussion. And I will confine my comments and a question to the last three panels, panelists on the left. As you very rightly said, Bhakha, at the outset, that we need to end this discussion with some sort of a definition acceptable to everybody on terrorism. I don't think we have come to that. Mm. But having said that, I would agree with Sharmeen and Raza and, of course, yourself when you talk about Pakistan, and Shunmin very eloquently put it, that there are vested interests who are trying to uh, create trouble in Pakistan. And that is probably what gives the perception of Pakistan being a failing state or a failed state. But let me tell you, a country which produces somebody like Shunmin, who got us the Oscar this year, a country which is going to complete a full cycle for civilian government, a country which is well on its way to economic recovery, I don't think that can be in any sense classified a failed state. My question to you, is question to you, uh, Barkha, you have been to Pakistan in the last 10 years more time than I have been. Please, <laughs> please tell us what is your own perception about Pakistan? Thank you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I will put on the spot here, but yes, it is indeed true that some of the comments that we've heard about Pakistan, I think seeking to find a voice for itself, that's my overwhelming impression. Uh, I see it as a state that is in a schizophrenic relationship with itself. I see many, many, many brave people battling the odds, strong vocal people from civil society, very brave politicians. I, I, I would want to say that without any one particular party, I really feel that the politicians of, of Pakistan that are battling uh, to assert themselves against a military rule, seeking to make history, fighting for democracy, I think that's a fight that needs to be admired. I see all the problems as well. I see the problems of fundamentalism. I see the problems of deep radicalization. I see the problems of sectarian violence. And I worry that I have so many Pakistani friends who are braver than anybody else I know. They're liberal, they're outspoken, they're passionate. Uh, so many of their best writers are here at this festival. We have Sharmin who's made global headlines. I worry that the liberal, sometimes I worry that the liberals will lose the fight. But I think it's a very worthy fight that's being fought in Pakistan and any help that can be given to those fighting for democracy, that help should be given. 
for me personally is can the world afford for Pakistan to fail is the question actually because Pakistan is armed with nuclear weapons it's the fifth most populous country in the world this is not Afghanistan this is not Somalia the world must will Pakistan to not fail because if Pakistan fails it's not just going to affect us it is going to affect the rest of the world I think we absolutely all agree on that. I'm going to take the next question. I think I, I, I actually to, can't see To your the, left. To your left. To my left, if you can stand, yes. <laughs> Where are you? Please wave at me if you have the mic. Do please, you have the mic? Please stand up. Please stand up. Hello. <laughs> yep. We can uh, hear okay. you. So I think over the okay, past right. okay. uh, few decades, we've seen that political Islam has been in conflict with the idea of a modern Westphalian uh, nation state. So uh, do you think the tension is going to ease out over the coming years, or are you just going to see more failed states coming to being as you know, as is defined by the West. Okay, I think Reza's uh, itching to take that and I'll allow yeah. Mary to have no. a word. In this yeah, I, I, th I think you're incorrect. On the contrary, political Islam has been adapting itself to the Westphalian conception of a nation state. That's what Islamism is all about. Uh, religious nationalism is still nationalism. So, so I think I think the the foundation of your question is incorrect. Uh, if, if I can add to that uh, the question of political Islam uh, as Reza said it's it's unfolding for example some would say in Egypt that may not coincide with somebody else's notion of democracy is there an inbuilt conflict is what she was asking between political Islam and a certain Western uh, notion of democracy no no, I mean, she's just asking the question. <laughs> Mary, if you want to take that. Um, yeah, I mean, if I can just, uh, the only place I know about is Africa. I'm sorry, <laughs> Sub-Saharan Africa. But maybe political Islam is not quite uh, the right word, uh, at least in, with reference to what's happening in Africa. It's more sort of violent Islamist extremism. But you can now see all the way from Nigeria in the West, uh, Mali, Niger stretching all the way across to Somalia, Kenya, and then reaching even to Yemen, uh, which is no longer in Africa. There's an almost near continuous arc or belt of people who are um, absolutely, the, the whole point of their lives is to uh, create some giant Sharia state that stretches. I mean, the Somalis say they want it to go all the way to Alaska. And I think that. Um, this is something that is colliding massively with this Western, uh, I suppose, yeah, it is still a Western neo-colonial attitude towards the world. And probably, unless there can be some kind of dialogue between those two groups, I just think the situation, at least in Africa, is going to get worse rather than better. Oh, I, I know that we have... Just to be clear, that is not political Islam. That's Islamic transnationalism. So... Yeah, those are two different things. Okay, I have ba to move. Barka, I'm sorry. I, there's a lady over here to your far right. Okay, she I have no idea where you are. Far right. <laughs> I'm waving in the center here. Can you see me in the aisle? Straight ahead of you? Yes. And there's a lady just here who's been waiting very patiently, and then we'll try to get back to the front. Okay, go ahead. Uh, my question is that why in your, the bullseye in your dartboard is the United States. Um, you know, it obviously suits people to ally themselves with the United States and then suddenly to change. Um, that's one part of the question. And the other issue is on the Palestine issue where you think there should be more international pressure uh, where India would go with that. Why is it then with Kashmir you're not open to any international intervention? Okay, uh, Declan, if you want to take that uh, question. Uh, is it too easy to make Americans the fall guy in every, in every debate? Well, I mean, I mean, clearly... And, and, and she had a question on Kashmir sure. as well. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I, mean, I mean, there's an obvious reason. I mean, it's, it's completely obvious why the, Ameri why the U.S. is the, the, ta the target, if you like, of a lot of the conversation we've had this evening just because the United States is the dominant power and has been responsible for most of the major military interventions over the last... A decade across the world. Um, that said, I think looking forward, it is very interesting to see, uh, as Reza uh, alluded to, the relative decline of the US uh, that, that has clearly started, I think, in world terms, the economic rise of China. Um, and I think it's going to be very interesting looking forward over the next, perhaps not the next years, but perhaps the next decades, about how the world manages that 
change, if you like, where one is rising and one is falling. And the United States has been dominant because the United Nations system has been so politically dysfunctional over the last while that it has failed to manage any of these conflicts. Um, and I see that the, if the role of the United Nations is not strengthened over that period, mm. it seems that the tension between one rising and one falling could potentially be quite perilous for the rest of us. Okay, the question here in the front. Could Jen. we just have the young lady there and then we'll go to the gentleman? Just him and then we'll do it the okay, other way sure. around. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Barkha, if you are looking for definition of a failed state, where I think the states run, state uh, rig doesn't run, or it cannot protect its people, its women, its children, I think that's a failed state. Or where justice cannot be rendered, that is a failed state. But I would like to see Pakistan is a successful state. The day Pakistan fails, I think India will have tremors here and we mm. too will fail. Yeah. And India, Pakistan, I think, will never fail because I could see there are protests in favor of Shias who have been killed. There are Malalas in Pakistan who are raising their voice yeah. and Pakistan will be a successful state. Thank you. Thank you for that. I think Malala Yousafzai is uh, really also a story out of Pakistan as much as everything else is. And uh, the, young, uh, the young girl here, someone had a hand here. Okay, uh, the front row, if you could give the mic in the front row, please. So sorry, sir. Uh, if you could just sit down. We've got so many people wanting to... Ah, beg jai, please. Bhai sir, beg jai. Sir, we have don't, a question don't worry about it. Lady just just here. I'll handle it. Yeah. And then there, yeah. Uh, well, my question is that we all agree that Pakistan should not fail as a state, right? So what do you want, you know, the world and especially India to do for you so that, you know, you don't go, you become a successful state then? Sharmi. <laughs> The question is not what the world can do for us, but what we can do for ourselves, firstly. Um, the world has been doing quite a lot with us, and obviously that has not worked for us. Um, I honestly believe that Pakistan needs to start investing in education. Change does not happen overnight. It is going to, it's not going to happen in my lifetime. I think it's going to take at least a generation for change to happen. But until Pakistan gives such a large percentage of its budget to defense and ignores health and education and all the critical um, um, fields and that it needs to put money into, I think there's going to be enormous problems for the country. I think right now I'm aware of a movement that's starting to pressure the politicians who are all running for elections to bring the education to the forefront to start talking about how much their political parties will give to education when they come into power. I don't think there are any easy answers for Pakistan right now, but education seems like the obvious way to move forward. All right. Uh, I have a gentleman who seems very, very keen to just say a comment. Please be quick, sir. Thank you, thank you. Please thank you. Don't worry, just give the mic here. Yes, I have to, I'll give you the if you can, uh, we have the young girl on the left. Young girl on the yeah, left, if you can waiting. get up so we can no, see no, you. She's just over there. She's not in the light. If you would like to speak. Yes. Uh, Where my question. Uh, here. Where? Are you? Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Ma'am, my question would be to Miss Charmin. Uh, Ma'am, uh, all right. So I'm a bit, uh, I just need a slight clarification regarding your stance. So on one level, you talk about how you do imagine a situation like uh, the Yugoslavia for Pakistan because of the sectarian conflicts that might be uh, going on. And on another level, uh, we, do know, uh, we do know that even though, the civilian, uh, even though the government might be able to complete its term, we do have the presence of Mr. Padri who, uh, who does talk about military, uh, military and judiciary in a very, uh, in a very, very uh, active way. So do you think, do you, do you still say on, on whatever definition of a failed state that you do prescribe to that Pakistan would not be one? Um, firstly, I would say that um, Mr. Kadri is like, if any of you have seen Wag the Dog, the movie, um, Mr. Kadri is Wag the Dog, um, <laughs> to be honest, uh, the way I look at it. Um, and uh, he is going to be irrelevant. He's come in, he was supposed to leave for Canada with his family. Had the Canadian government not caught on to the fact that he has two different names, one in Canada and one in Pakistan, um, the, the Kadri is quite a mystery. How he was able to galvanize while he lives on welfare in Canada, millions of dollars to put his face across Pakistan and bring all these people out onto the streets is a whole different question onto itself. Um, do I see Pakistan becoming a Yugoslavia in my lifetime? I see there are troubling indicators that show that 
there is insurgencies within Pakistan which are difficult to control. The government's writ is weak in many, many areas. But I live in Pakistan, and for those of us who live in Pakistan, we must also look at the indicators that show us hope. And I choose for the time being to look at the things that give me hope. Okay. Can any of you speak to the way in which critiques of a failed state by members of its diaspora uh, become adopted as rationales for intervention and the challenges of having a productive discussion about, this, about states undergoing political struggle <coughs> without inadvertently inviting anybody, anybody's intervention? Uh, mm. Do you want to take that, Lali? The diaspora defining uh, yeah, <laughs> the debate. I was so into the Pakistan conversation, <laughs> I've forgotten now where I am from. Um, so, <laughs> you know, what's interesting about that question is that in, during the Green Revolution, uh, a few years back, the diaspora community in the United States, the Iranian diaspora community, was actually begging for Western intervention in Iran. And it was one of these unique situations where people who hadn't lived in the country for 30 years decided that they knew what was best for the people who were living in the country and risking their lives by going and protesting in the streets. And the way that the world is shaping itself now, it's odd to me that the people who are not really connected to a body politic or a day-to-day -day life seem to have an opinion as to what is the best. And the people who are in the country, because of the tide of global information, they don't have a voice anymore to say what could be the most ideal future for us. And because of the censorship of the Iranian government and the Iranian media, the louder noise was made by the diaspora, as we saw also in Libya and in Syria. Yeah. And the diaspora gets the headlines, and the diaspora gets the news bites, and the people in the country are silenced by the violence and the inevitable history that's falling on their heads at that moment. Um, and I think, personally, that the diaspora should have no say in what's going on. And even though it does feed into the Western imperialism, they shouldn't listen. And the people in the country, as Sharmeen has been saying, should determine their fate. But it's very, very difficult because something about the way information is moving is making mm. it very hard for them to galvanize the ear of the international community. Okay, there uh, are a lot of very passionate people wanting to speak in the audience, but Barka has decided to finish with a young man. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. Everybody is, this, is, this, uh, is this all we have time for? Yes. Can we take a couple more? Yes. Okay, last yes. question. Yeah. Mine is a more hypothetical question. I want to know if, you know, in the current scenario, is there a possibility of a failed nation, not just a state, as we were discussing? Is the possibility of a failed nation and the concept exists anymore? Uh, Reza, I'll give you, uh, anyway. I'll give you that. Uh, <laughs> the idea of a country, I mean, in India, we often say it's an idea of India, and then we attribute qualities to it. So it, it isn't just ge geographical borders, but a concept, an ideology, as it were. Yeah, uh, in fact, uh, I don't know if Lala is going to punch me about this or not, but I think the, the Kurds might become a failed nation, uh, particularly mm -hmm. if Iraq does break up and you do see a Kurdistan that is not a welcome place for Iran's or Turkey's Kurds. Remember, when we talk about nation, we are talking about a people, a collection of people who are united by something, either language or ethnicity or culture, but a state if, if some of those people get a state, uh, a state that, that is unwelcome to others of those people, then the nation itself could fail. Same thing could possibly happen um, with the Palestinians, though I don't think the Palestinians will ever have their own state. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've been uh, allowed one more question, so we'll take it somewhere maybe at the back. And I let... Okay, there's a gentleman a here. Difficult choice, it's so I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make the choice, I'm leaving. <laughs> Thank, thank you for supporting me. Uh, my question is for Shamin. There were lots of thought about the dysfunctional relation between Pakistan and America. Uh, as I describe it, uh, the relation of Pakistan with America is that of a strange couple who live under the same roof but not sharing the same bedroom. My question to Shamin is, uh, what do you see uh, the relation of Pakistan in the coming five to ten years? Would you be start sharing the same bedroom or you will be finally come out of the roof? <laughs> Um, well, uh, Raza rightly pointed out, the United States is at war with Pakistan. Um, so what I, would, what I see happening is with the withdrawal in Afghanistan, Pakistan is going to have to contend with a very real threat 
with the Taliban. I always feel that why would the Taliban want Afghanistan when Pakistan is clearly the bigger prize? And um, that's a real danger for Pakistan. And if the Pakistani army and the intelligence agencies continue to work with the Taliban, then there, there are going to be issues. And of course, the United States is going to play a major role in this. The drone warfare, how much would that expand? How many more civilians are going to die? And uh, to be honest, it depends on who's going to come into power. I unfortunately, in, in Pakistan's next elections, which are right around the corner, I unfortunately think that it's a very unpredictable relationship. Just when I think that Pakistan and the United States are actually taking two steps forward, they take 10 steps backwards. When things like Raymond Davis happen, um, when things happen mm. in the country that are not controlled by the two countries, but are external things that happen, and suddenly they throw both the countries in the mix. So unfortunately, I don't hold the crystal ball. Would I wish for the United States and Pakistan to have a less dysfunctional relationship? Yes, but I also think that Pakistan needs to move away from the United States? Well, I think it's safe to say that there are no crystal balls when it comes to uh, how history shapes and, and takes form and uh, the history of how nations have not just emerged but also collapsed at times points to that. Uh, we will end uh, with having agreed on one thing, that building a state takes a long, long time. And so don't jump to hasty verdicts no matter what your headlines tell you. A big round of applause for our panel today. Thank you so much, everybody. She is very good at this. God. If, I would if I could just say thank you so much to our panelists. Obviously, we are in a democracy. There is a chance to go and talk to everybody.